an Old Testament story is under the stars one night. So we're glad that you're here for worship. We're happy on today, and I hope you will enjoy just sitting back and being under the stars and just enjoy Camping Sunday together. It's my great will to encounter God in a new way today. I'm going to ask Tim Turkington to come on up and join me. We're going to have a little fun exercise to get us uh, in the mood of camping. You've already heard some campfire and evening uh, wood sounds, but we're going to help you uh, make some of those sounds yourself. Let me grab this mic. When we were together in a conference a couple, a couple years ago, someone from the North Carolina United Methodist Camp did a wonderful uh, activity with us, and we want to do it with you this morning. So you're going to help to make those forest nighttime noises. So let's, we're going to keep in three sections. This is one section. The middle is the second section. And you're the third section. Okay, we're going to have more fun here. Tim, tell us what to do. Okay, so actually this is not so much about camping as about food. So, and I'm sure you're all thinking, thinking about food already, thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. But imagine that we're having green beans and rolls and ham. Okay, so you're already thinking about that. And this group over here is thinking very intensely about green beans. Okay, so you're just going to say green beans. Say green beans.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give you to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, which means the house of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Camping was not in my a family's vacation repertoire. So I went camping for the first time just a year ago. Me and my two boys and a couple other dads were experienced in camping and their boys out to the Eno River. And we borrowed a tent and we borrowed some sleeping bags and I packed way more than we needed. Because how was I supposed to know what a dad and a couple of boys needed to survive a whole night? More than a mile from civilization. We had a really great time. I think the most fun was watching the six boys with their flashlights after dark, running around, scaring one another, not even tripping or running into trees. We had a great time except for one part, the sleeping part. <laughs> the tent we had borrowed was a little off the smallish side, so we were kind of smashed closer together than we would have liked, and you experienced campers would have known this, but the ground was hard. <laughs> and that made it a little hard to sleep, and even though we had more than we needed, we hadn't brought anything like a pillow. So one boy was snuggled up with a sweatshirt under his head, and I was, I had a, a, a t-shirt under my head, and, and the other boy had, um, well, it was a pillow, it was about this big, and he tucked away in the tiny little sleeping bag he had bought. So the next morning we were leaving the Eno River State Park, and I asked them if they had a good time. Oh, yeah, we had a great time, this is the most fun we've ever had, we want to do the game, we want to do the game. I'm three finished. One, we've got to have a bigger tent. Two, we've got to have softer sleeping bags. And three, we've got to bring pillows. <laughs> so needless to say, this April, when we did it again, we had what we needed. Jacob spent the night out under the stars, not because he was looking for a little bit of camping fun. Jacob was on the run. He was on the run from his brother. He had tricked and robbed his brother Esau one too many times. And so his mom came to him and said, Jacob, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. <laughs> so get out of here. Go, run, flee, go to my brothers in Haran. So without delay, Jacob left an impromptu camping trip. He was on the run. Which might explain why he forgot his pillow too. On the run, afraid for his life, from his brother. He didn't have time to pack. But that doesn't mean you don't need to rest. It doesn't mean you don't get tired. So he got to a certain place. He knows where it was. 
And the sun had set and it was dark and he wanted to sleep. So he looked around and he found what any of us would have gotten, a stone. And he set the stone up as a pillow and laid his head down on it and somehow he managed to get to sleep. And that's what happened. That famous dream. The ladder and the angels and the Lord standing right there next to him. Now someone familiar with the spiritual traditions of the Celts and of the British Isles might say that Jacob had stumbled onto a thin place. Have you heard the terminology a thin place before? A thin place, so it goes, it is a place where that barrier between our ordinary world and the other world, capital O, is particularly thin. It's a place where the veil between our world and the next world, uh, a spiritual realm, is, is sheer. When you come across a thin place, it's a place where you can reach out and feel the divine and the holy closer than you've ever felt it before. A thin place is not an ordinary place. It's an extraordinary, sacred, holy place. Now, for whatever reason, there seem, so I hear, to be many of these kinds of places in the British Isles, in Ireland, and in Scotland, and in England, where everywhere you turn, there's a holy grove, or a holy well, or a, a holy tree, or a, a holy hill, where for centuries people have come because they have felt there's some spiritual power where they, can, where they can touch and reach out and experience the divine. The island of Iona is one of these places. It's, it's a, a, a place where pilgrims go to experience God. Even before Christians got there, Iona was a sacred place. And for centuries it has been a place of Christian monasteries and, and of deep Christian spirituality. One pilgrim to Iona wrote, walking around this tiny island, you can almost feel the presence of remnant spirits from another realm. Recollecting the hundreds of monks who served in ancient times. The overriding feeling of this place is a sense of the whole. So if you're feeling that your everyday life is just a bit too ordinary, and you'd like to find a place where it's easy to cross over to another world, you're in luck. Because for $2,000, you can go on the Thin Places mystical tour of Ireland on Queen Airfield. Ten days, nine nights, fifteen stops with a full-time tour guide who will show you the difference between an ordinary place and a thin place. No, seriously, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if there were places that were so thin, where the barrier was so sheer between our world and our ordinary lives and something more, that all we had to do was book a flight and then get on a bus and, and minutes later we could be reaching out and touching a place where meaning is deep and hope is alive and the spirit is all around. Wouldn't that be great? Someone might have thought Jacob had stumbled onto one of these thin places. A place where it's easy to find God. Unless you read the story. Because the way the story begins, there's absolutely nothing about this place that would distinguish it from any other. It's an absolutely ordinary place. It's anonymous. It has no name. The only reason Jacob is there is because that's where he happened to be when the sun set and he needed to rest. It's like when you're on your family vacation and you haven't planned your itinerary very well and you're tired and it's dark and there's a motel six. You just stay at the Motel 6 because it's there. It's just where he was. There was no breathtaking view. There was no babbling brook giving him peace. It doesn't mention it. There was no magnetic spiritual power pulling him to this place, making him say, I should stop here. No. He's out under the stars. And he just needs to rest. That's all there is. This place it could be any place. It could be your kid's school playground. It could be the church 
like grounded. It could be the library at Crowsdale. It could be a, heaven forbid, a rest area on I-85. It could be any place. Jacob has not discovered a holy place. He's found that ordinary place. And that's where God finds him. Now, I think that human desire to find hidden places runs very deep. We love to be in a place where we experience awe and wonder, where we're inspired, where we get goosebumps. That's why we go on tours of, of cathedrals in, in Europe, or if we don't have the money, we go to the new chapel and just pretend. <laughs> because these kinds of places inspire us. They make us feel close to God. Think about a time where you if you have doubt or you need to pray or you're in some kind of pain, you might come to this place. We said it in our greeting, this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. We long to find a place where we can be close to God. But who would have thought that that place, when you're out sleeping under the stars, with a, a rock for a pillow, not faithfully searching for God and fearfully fleeing from an angry brother. Who would have thought that's the kind of place where you can encounter God? Who would have thought that God meets you in the most mundane, ordinary, everyday, nothing sacred about them places of our lives? Jacob has discovered a place where it's easy to find God. He's discovered a God who can find him any place. He's also discovered a God who likes candy. It's true. Every Christmas we read the first chapter of the Gospel of John. The story of Jesus coming into our world, the Word became flesh, it says, and dwelt among us. And if you translated that little phrase, dwelt among us, literally, it would be, he pitched his tent among us. In Jesus, God pitched his tent among us. He climbed down the ladder and pitched his tent. And he also forgot his pillow. We were in good company. Remember, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, referring to himself, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus didn't have a place. He didn't set up an office or a shrine, or a, a temple, or even a church, where we have to go to find Him. Jesus pitched His tent among us, and it was a portable tent, so He could move and find us wherever we are. One of the most famous stories of a conversion in Christianity is the conversion of the guy we now call Saint Augustine. But that time, he was just Augustine. He became, he became a bishop in, in the 4th century, and one of the church's most prolific and important theologians. He was raised by a Christian mom, and when he was young, he, he gave up the Christian faith and went on his own search for truth and meaning. And that search took him to many different philosophies. One of them was a philosophy, a quasi-religious school called the Manichees. The Manichees believed that, that, uh, that evil in the material world was evil, and, and that the spiritual world was good, and somehow you had to find out how to get out of the material world and into the spiritual world. And Augustine was a manatee for about 10 years. And then he encountered some philosophies that were derived from Plato. And he thought, these are a little more reasonable than the manatee. So he left that behind and, and dabbled in this for a while until, until he heard a Christian preacher named Ambrose. And now Augustine was finally in a place where this could make sense to him. If the material world is bad, then the story about God becoming flesh isn't as absurd as you might first have thought. Now, he didn't fully convert at this time because there were some other obstacles, one of which was he didn't want to give up his footloose and fancy-free lifestyle. He, he prayed quite famously, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> that didn't make it into the prayer. <laughs> Eventually, the Spirit helped Augustine overcome his obstacles to belief and giving himself fully over to this God. And so he was baptized as a Christian. But the most important thing about his search for God is when he got to the end of it, he looked back on his journey and noticed that at no place was God ever absent from him. God was there the whole way. He said, God is closer to me than I am to myself. 
in his journeys through Africa and Italy and through one philosophy and another. He discovered that wherever he was, God was there. God was closer to him than his own breath. In Jesus, God has pitched his tent among us. So wherever we are, God can find us. Jacob woke from the dream a little frightened. And he wanted to remember this moment and this place. So he took that rock that he had set up as his pillow. And he said, I'm going to make an altar here. Because in this ordinary place, this is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. So he set it up as an altar. And called the place Bethel. The house of God. Now you'll see along this altar rail that there are lots of blocks. Call them Jacob's stones. And in just a couple minutes, I'm going to invite you to come forward and get one of these rocks so that you can take one home and let it remind you that wherever you are is the gate of heaven. Wherever you find yourself, you can be in the house of God. Maybe there are some of us who are, like Augustine, in the middle of a search for God. And for you, the stone might be a reminder or a signifier of the fact the search can end right here and now. Because this place, can be for you the gate of heaven, can be for you the house of God. There might be others of us who want to get one of the small stones and put it in our pocket to carry around with us a portable altar to remind us that wherever we are, that's the gate of heaven. Wherever we go, that's the house of God. I think a lot of us will want to take one and put it in an ordinary place in our life. I'm going to put one at the kitchen sink. I spend a lot of hours at, in the evening at the kitchen sink washing dishes. And, and that seems to be the least sacred place in my life. And I'm going to look at that rock and remember, even here, house of God, gate of heaven. God can be right here at the kitchen sink. It can become a sacred spot. Or you might want to put it next to your computer in your cubicle at work. Just feet away from the most frustrating co-worker you've ever met. And you can leave it even there, gate of heaven, house of God. Or if you're living in a family with others, you might want to take your rocks and put them on your kitchen table. This is a place where you eat together and laugh together and yell at one another, let's be honest. <laughs> Even there, right there, gave it a house of God. I invite you to take one of these rocks and use it however you need to remind you that wherever you go, that's where you can be God because in Jesus Christ, God has made a descendant choice not to live in a grove or on a hill or even in a sanctuary, but to be with us, ordinary old you and me, with us wherever we are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, bless us. Gracious and loving God, we pray that you would meet us here. Make this be for us the gate of heaven and the house of God, and especially give us eyes to see that wherever we go, there you are. In Jesus' name, Amen. As Reynolds sings, I invite you to come.
Lord proclaimed invites us to respond in so many ways. Now we will uh, respond in prayer. For the prayers of the people, I will invite you to pray, either silently or aloud, for groups of people. After each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. So it'll go something like this. I'll say something like, let's pray for people who are sick. There'll be a time of silence. During that silence, if you want to name someone who's sick out loud, please feel free. And then I will close our silence with, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. All right, let's, let's pray together. Great God of light, we come to you this morning in the spirit of prayer and community, with the stars above us and your love all around us. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for your people. Friends, let us pray together for our families, loved ones, and the people of Duke Memorial Church. Lord, in your mercy. Friends, let us pray together for those who are sick, suffering, or in trouble. Lord, in your mercy. Friends, let us pray together for our city, state, and country, and for the wisdom and courage of our leaders. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, let us pray together for the Church Universal, its members, its message, and its mission. Lord, in your mercy, Friends, let us pray together for those who have lived and died in your service. Lord, in your mercy. Most gracious and loving God, you crown our prayers with evidence all around us of your provision. Hear now our praise for the order and beauty and constancy of the natural world and for the blessed community of people who make this life a garden. Receive our thanks for the treasure of your grace. Help us, your people in every place, thin and ordinary, and in every circumstance, to serve you gladly. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We respond to the word of God also by offering ourselves. Uh, hopefully in your email box this week you received the latest e-newsletter. There are uh, opportunities in that newsletter and on the website to uh, express your thanks to God in service. 
The BBS folks have provided us with a way to reach out to our immediate community through the uh, hygiene bags and food bags, which uh, if you travel the byways and highways of Durham, you know are in great need. Um, this provides us an easy way to reach out to someone, find out their name, continue to pray for them, and uh, know that they're not alone in their suffering. I also want to put in a plug for those of you who uh, are able to give blood. Uh, maybe you read like I did this week that our supplies of blood are very low across the nation, uh, but the need, of, of course, is always high. So if that's something you can do or have thought about doing, this is a good week to do it. We respond now by sharing the bounty that God has given us through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
receive now these gifts, which we return to you in gratitude for your extravagant love. Use them, we pray, to replenish your creation and your creatures. Send us into the world refreshed for your service. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.